our tour begins in the Spanish Gallery of London's National Gallery. The paintings here date from 1612, with Francisco Ribalta's The Vision of Father Simon, through to 1675, with Bartolome Murillo's sublime work, The Heavenly and Earthly Trinities. These 63 years of the Spanish Habsburg Empire saw four monarchs on the throne, and mark the golden years of Spanish art. It is little wonder, then, that the main focus of the works in this room are by the court painter Diego Velázquez. Velázquez worked for Philip IV from the beginning of his reign in the early 1620s. The relationship was constant, if fraught, and the two portraits we see of the king in this gallery present two very different figures. This work dates from around 1631, when the king was just 26 years old. We see him standing tall and confident, with his left hand on his sword. His gaze is firm and condescending. He is elaborately dressed before a sumptuous velvet curtain. The fabric of his clothes, though slightly faded now, are of expensive purple-brown and bright silver. Around his neck hangs a golden chain with the badge of the golden fleece, a symbol of chivalry and honour. He is every inch a king. In his right hand, we can see he is holding a piece of paper. It says, Diego Velasquez, painter to the king. This portrait is not only a statement for King Philip, but for Velasquez too. He is alerting the viewer to his singular position. He is the king's painter, a man of status. The deep texture of the paint and the way Velasquez plays with shadow and light, particularly on the fabrics, identified this as a transitional moment for the painter. He had recently spent a year and a half in Italy, visiting Venice, Ferrara, Bologna, Rome and several other cities. Here he met Ribera and was influenced by the work of artists such as Guido Reni. In this painting, we can see him experimenting with techniques and emulating the works he had encountered on his travels. Further down the wall, we meet an older Philip, he is 51, soberly dressed in black, as was his usual custom, though still with a whiff of decadence in his characteristically flamboyant moustache. The strain of 25 years of difficult rule has taken its toll. Philip had overseen the Thirty Years' War and had ruled over the Spanish Empire at the height of its power, but his reign was plagued by domestic crises. His eyes and cheeks are drawn, and his expression is that of quiet command, rather than confident swagger. He wears the same chain around his neck, and he is still a majestic presence, though this painting is much smaller and more intimate than the previous. Between these two works is one of the National Gallery's real treasures. This is one of the most famous paintings, not just of Velasquez, but of all time. This is the only extant female nude painted by Velasquez. Spanish artists were far more conservative than their Italian counterparts. Ready comparisons can be made with Titian's Venus with a Mirror, who paints the almost naked goddess facing the viewer. The painting delights in its risque qualities, but this comparison doesn't make the Venus of Velasquez any less sensual. The goddess of love lies reclined with her back to us, the folds of the fabric beneath her direct our eye across the delicate curves of her naked body. Her skin has a pearly, luminescent texture, and though she lies still, there is movement in the taut muscles on her back. As she is subjected to the viewer's gaze, she too partakes in gazing at herself. Her face is reflected back to us in a mirror held up by Cupid, though it is out of focus. It is almost as though Velasquez is inviting the viewer to imagine their own goddess, their sweetheart perhaps, in place of the classical deity. But let's look more closely. Is she gazing at herself, or is she looking at us, reflected in her glass? Is she in fact turning the tables, reasserting herself? Let us cast our own gaze outside of the Spanish gallery for a moment. Here, through this archway, we can catch a glimpse of the room beyond. Framed by this doorway is Van Dyck's arresting portrait of another king, Charles I of Britain. 
The scale and grandeur of this painting accentuates the tension between the image the artist has created and the reality it seeks to mask. This king appears to us on horseback, resplendent in his shining armour, though with a hint of the debonair, as his flowing locks move gently in the breeze to reveal an expensive pearl earring. Charles looks wistfully out into the distance, surveying his kingdom, as his deferential servant stands beside him, ready to pass his helmet. He is a warrior, and his calm control of his powerful horse is symbolic of the commanding ruler he wishes to be. However, in reality, Charles I was not the tall, graceful, powerful man Van Dyck paints here. He was small and delicate. He had been a weak and sickly child who struggled even to walk. But from early in his life, he had sought to overcome these trials and became a keen and distinguished horseman. And here we see him in his element. Though looking at the confident king before us, it is important to remember that the civil war was only a few years away and that in a decade this king would be executed for treason. Van Dyck was, like Velasquez, the principal court painter. Both artists have been knighted by their respective kings and both enjoyed the status that came with such patronage. But this was not the story for the majority of artists at the time. One such painter was Bartolomé Morillo, who, though younger than Velázquez, was also born in Seville and spent most of his life in that city. For a few years, he worked as an artist in Madrid during the same time that Velázquez was active there. Morillo was a recognised and successful artist, but the lack of court patronage meant that his life was very different. Moving along the right wall, we are met with a painting that seizes the soul. Murillo's sublime, the heavenly and earthly trinities. It was painted somewhere between 1675 and 1682, and in it we can see a kind of ethereal buoyancy that is so characteristic of late Baroque style. The painting explores the idea that Christ is both human and divine, at the same time mortal and the Son of God. He looks as though he is about to ascend to God above, but he is also grounded by his earthly parents on either side of him. As the light of the heavens shines on his face, our gaze is drawn gradually upwards to the dove of the Holy Ghost who hovers above him, and then up again to God, whose arms are held out to his Son. The central line of the painting is this Holy Trinity, and as the viewer's eye ascends to heaven, so they are encouraged to think beyond earthly life to eternal bliss. These are just a handful of the extraordinary works to be found in this room. Using the link in the video description box below, you can explore the other wonders to be found here. In the next episode, we will move through these doors into the Italian galleries.